Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to the 43rd uh, Schofield Memorial Lecture. My name is Gordon Kirby. I'll be uh, the ceremonies for the presentation today. So uh, what I'll do is give, for those of you who don't know the history of um, Frank Schofield, I'll give you a brief, very brief overview and then introduce our speaker for today. So the Schofield Memorial Lecture is dedicated to Frank Schofield. He was a colorful and influential pioneer of veterinary medicine in, in Canada. He emigrated from England to, as a teenager and entered OBC in 1907. Soon after graduation, he traveled to Korea as a Canadian missionary to teach bacteriology. Due to his activities in defense of Korean people against Japanese occupation, he had to leave Korea and return to OBC in 1921, where he worked for 33 years. On retirement, he returned to Korea to work for the College of Veterinary Medicine in Seoul. In recognition of his distinguished services to Korea's independence, Dr. Schofield became the only foreigner to be buried at the National Patriot Cemetery. While Schofield had many significant contributions to veterinary medicine in the first half of the 20th century, undoubtedly the most important was the discovery of an antithrombin substance in spoiled clover. His observation that only calves fed spoiled clover eventually hemorrhaged revealed a problem with blood clotting factors. The compound dicumerol was eventually identified and then developed into the anticoagulant of warfarin. Dr. Schofield's discoveries were not serendipitous or anecdotal, but based on meticulous scientific inquiry. Schofield's systematic approach to veterinary medicine and his evidence-based campaign to promote best veterinary practice and improve health outcomes foreshadowed the acceptance of this approach as current dogma in both human and, and animal medicine and veterinary medicine. The Schofield Memorial Lecture celebrates Frank Schofield's life his research and his role as a motivational icon who undoubtedly inspired the many research achievements that have transpired here at OBC since. Dr. Schofield provides us with the incentives to achieve the highest standards of effort, intellect, and ethics, to practice evidence-based medicine and to strive towards translation of our scientific discoveries into effective advances in both animal and human health. Our speaker today is Ian York. Ian is alumnus of the Ontario Veterinary College. He, he graduated in 1985 and practiced veterinary medicine until 1992. In 1990, he received an MSc in uh, veterinary immunology under the uh, supervision of Jan Thorsen. In 1994, he received a PhD in virology from McMaster University and then uh, was a research fellow at Harvard University. 2000. And then he was a research assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts Medical School and an assistant professor at Michigan State University until 2010. He is presently the lead for molecular virology and vaccines team in the immunology and pathogenesis branch influenza division at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. His overall research program is in the area of molecular mechanisms of host immunity to viruses. His present research focuses on antibody-based and cellular immunity to influenza viruses, links between immunity and viral evolution and pathogenicity, and evaluating and improving uh, influenza vaccination. So I was just informed that uh, we should really give thanks to the US Congress for making Dr. York available to us today. <laughs> And that's because they passed the Continuing Appropriations Act and, and suspended the debt uh, limit. And I was told that uh, it would be illegal for Dr. York to come here and give the presentation today uh, while he was on furlough. And uh, that applied to all federal workers. So uh, Lord, thank you that you're not going to be arrested after this talk. <laughs> I hope. So without further ado, please help me uh, welcome Dr. York.
Okay, uh, thank you very much, Gordon. It's been uh, terrific to come back here. This is uh, the first time I've been back to OVC for nearly 20 years, so it's uh, been uh, terrific to see everything that's new and uh, everything that's old and to see a number of uh, old friends and um, make some new ones, I hope. Um, <clears throat> and so I am going to be talking about influenza, uh, which I'm sure everybody is at least uh, familiar with to some extent. Uh, it's been around for a long, long time. It's uh, been known, uh, it, the first uh, influenza pandemics have been tracked back to the 1500s and multiple other pandemics have been tracked since then. Uh, it's been well known for, for many years to be uh, a massive uh, public health uh, burden. You can see uh, it was well understood to be uh, the physician's friend in uh, the early 1800s and well before that. Um, and still is today with really uh, surprisingly little uh, effect from many of the, the modern uh, changes. Although hopefully the physicians are a little bit less uh, blatant about it today. Um, this is the obligatory uh, uh, Virion portrait that every virologist has to show before they talk about it. I'm just, I just want to make three critical points about flu before I start talking about stuff that's maybe a little more interesting. Um, First of all is mutation. Flu viruses are RNA viruses, and RNA viruses mutate at an incredible rate. They have no error checking on their genome, and essentially every time a new genome is made, it has at least one mutation in it. So there's no such thing as a flu genome. It's a cloud of genomes that surrounds sort of a central average, and in that cloud is the, the, the virus is basically exploring a huge amount of genetic space and looking for ways to change and adapt and undergo new changes. So flu viruses uh, change with incredible speed. And that's the first critical thing. The next critical thing is the structure of their genome. Flu viruses have a segmented genome. They have eight independent segments of, uh, of RNA within their, their, within their uh, lipid envelope. And these components all can segregate independently. They're not physically linked in any way. So if two viruses, two flu viruses, infect the same cell, they'll make progeny cells, progeny viruses. Those progeny viruses will have every possible combination of all of those eight, eight segments. And this is a process known as reassortment. Um, those of you who have taken uh, virology will remember antigenic shift and antigenic drift. Antigenic shift uh, is this reassortment process. But antigenic shift is not the only form of reassortment. Reassortment is really common. Antigenic shift is something that's relatively rare, but reassortment in flu viruses happens all the time. And as what, so on top of the constant cloud of mutations that flu viruses undergo, you have the second source of variation where you take whole big chunks of genomes and shuffle them up and generate viruses that may have new properties altogether. Many of these viruses are useless. They're dead viruses because they're incompatible segments. But every so often, something will pop up that's better than the old ones. So two sources of massive variability, and so that's really critical for understanding flu. The other thing, just as a technical note, is to talk about the two major surface proteins on the virus, uh, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, HA and NA. Uh, and they're important because they're the major source of immunity to the viruses, and immunity to the viruses is one of the major drivers of natural selection. There are, that you end up with massive changes in all of these components, and so this provides a way of identifying viruses at least superficially. So you can have different, there's over 18 different subtypes of HA, over 10, or over 11 now is different subtypes of neuraminidase, and the two of them can shuffle around and form different combinations. And so you can track viruses superficially by their HA and NA types. You can talk about H1N1 viruses, H5N1, and so on. Um, those characteristics partially define a virus, but they're not the sole de uh, definition of it. And so that's another important point, that there's lots of complexities, but these uh, HA and NA ways HA and NA proteins provide at least a starting point for tracking virus evolution. What I'm going to do today is just give overview, really. Uh, I'm going to start off talking about animal viruses. Um, we at the CDC are a component of uh, uh, 
human health and uh, safety uh, department. So this, we're, our mandate is to look at human viruses. So I'll explain after that why we at the CDC are still very interested in uh, animal influenza viruses. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about flu virus evolution and some of the complexities and drivers of that. And I'll end up with just a little bit of some research that's going on in my lab. And I picked this research uh, not because it's a complete story or it's a massive story, but because it's something that I just think is actually very cool. So I hope you will as well. So avian influenza. Essentially, every influenza is an avian influenza. All of the viruses, with two exceptions, that we know of originate from birds. The two exceptions are bat viruses that have been very recently found in uh, South America and we don't understand where they came from. Uh, but aside from those, every virus, every mammalian virus that we know of can be tracked back to birds. Influenza is basically a disease of waterfowl, sometimes of shorebirds. Uh, in waterfowl and shorebirds, these are generally very mild infections, but Shorebirds and, and, and waterfowl provide a reservoir for a really massive population of viruses. Birds intermingle a lot. If you look at any lake, you'll see waterfowl in there, and they're not segregated by species. You get tremendous recombination among those. Uh, there are literally many hundreds of different subtypes in terms of HA and NA, and of course, even more combinations in terms of the internal genes. So waterfowl are a reservoir. They're the natural host. Um, they're a source of variation of the viruses. Um, one of the things that's critical about that's the other thing about what birds in general is that they're very mobile. Um, they, they travel around um, in geographically, they travel around in, in different uh, environmental contexts. They're present in cities, they're present in, in urban areas and rural areas. They interact with poultry, and that's especially true uh, in. in um, developing countries, so in Southeast Asia and so on, many, many um, most farmers keep poultry at least in the, at some level in the backyard, and those birds can interact with wild waterfowl. And in, in some cases, uh, the question of what's a wild and what's a domestic waterfowl is basically whatever you can get into your barn at night. <clears throat> and so these viruses can spread into domestic poultry, and they do spread into domestic poultry. And the issue there is that now, uh, once the viruses become, um, combine, come up, become uh, settled into domestic poultry, like chickens or ducks in developing countries, um, then they're a source to interact with people. And so that's the concern of the major, con one of the major paths for interaction from uh, viruses that start in waterfowl and move into chickens, and then potentially move into humans. <clears throat> One of the other species, so, so avian influenzas are the basis for all of the mammalian viruses, as I said. And swine are one of the major uh, reservoirs of many other, uh, many subtypes of influenza. Um, and, you know, swine are, um, in, in North America, we think of swine in, in very large commercial operations. Again, that's not the, the case in developing countries where they're often backyard swine and interact with, with birds very much. Um, the, the situation of, uh, uh, of swine is kind of different because they're capable of being infected directly by avian viruses and they're also capable of being infected directly with human viruses. So swine have the appropriate receptors and the appropriate uh, physiology that they can be infected by both, from both ends um, with purely avian viruses, with purely human viruses. And then these viruses have the potential to mix and reassort. Um, the history of flu in swine used to be fairly simple. So in 1918, the H1N1 pandemic virus, which, which was, uh, infected humans, jumped from humans into swine. And for many years, that was a dominant uh, influenza strain in, in swine. It was a much less virulent strain, of course, but it was still recognizably the same strain as caused the, pan the human pandemic in, in 1918. Um, then some complexities happened. A purely avian virus jumped into swine in Europe. Um, that com complicated things somewhat. And then a number of human viruses, 
the human virus uh, situation became more complicated as H3N2 viruses also moved into the human population. Those jumped back from humans into swine. And then in the 1990s, for reasons we don't understand, viruses in, flu, in swine basically went nuts. They started recombining with everything. Now there are many different subtypes. They reassort with, with each other at a crazy rate. Their internal genes are, are a mess. They're mixed up with all sorts of things as well as the HA and NA. And of course you all know uh, where that headed because that was the source of the 2009 pandemic which originated from a very complicated reassortment complex in swine. <clears throat> and of course, um, it's, e it's equally easy to see how humans can get in contact with swine. The commercial operations have a lot more restrictions, but in, in uh, context like state fairs in the US, uh, there's plenty of opportunity for humans to become in contact uh, with swine. <clears throat> Uh, so I covered all this stuff. Um, the, 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 one of the critical points about swine, in humans the subtypes of, of flu change rapidly. There's a, a very interconnected population in humans. Uh, there's a lot of sort of a dominant population immunity. I'll show you this more later on. But you get a continuous progression of changes in human uh, influenza viruses. In swine viruses, because pigs are much shorter lived, because they don't get vaccinated as much, uh, at least not on the same sort of global uh, uh, common scale. Um, viruses, the flu viruses, don't tend to evolve as rapidly in terms of their antigenic nature. And so what you have in swine is kind of a, a fossil record of human viruses. There's viruses in swine that are antigenically similar to the human viruses of the 1990s, of the 2000s, of the mid-2000s, of 2008. So the viruses from 2008, we're all immune to. The viruses from 1990, most of you guys are probably, from the mid-1990s, most of you guys are probably immune to, but there's a large population of people under maybe 15 years old who are not immune to those viruses anymore. We've passed on, they, they are still persisting in swine, but humans no longer see those. So swine potentially act as a reservoir of old, old flu strains that could potentially come back to bite us. The other two mammalian species that are uh, commonly affected by, uh, uh, by influenza are horses and dogs, and I'm going to treat them together uh, for reasons you'll see in a minute. Horse flu has been around for a long time, again, very well recognized. Uh, this is a cartoon from a, a, an a equine panzootic influenza that hit North America in 1872. It was a very mild disease. It didn't kill the horses, it just made them really sick. Uh, it hit New York, um, and uh, literally overnight, every horse in New York was too sick to pull a wagon, including the zebras in the zoo, uh, and the, it shut down the city. That was a form of, of transportation at the time. After a few days, the horses were all back, but for, for nearly a week, the city was shut down, and the virus continued to progress across North America. City after city was progressively shut down as the virus jumped into each one. The guys on the western coast watched it coming and there was nothing they could do about it. <clears throat> There's two, there have been two major strains of equine influenza. One is an H7N7 strain that went extinct in the 1970s. Uh, and that's again a common factor. We see new viruses appearing. We also see old viruses disappearing. We don't understand why either of those things happen to any large extent. The, other, the strain that's common in horses today is an H3N8. As you can guess by now, that's an avian influenza virus that jumped into horses in the 1960s. And then in the 2000s, that virus jumped from horses into dogs. That's why I'm treating them as the same thing. It's essentially the same strain, although now the dog strain has become much more dog adapted and doesn't replicate well in horses. There are other strains in, uh, of, of these viruses that are sporadically seen in, in different areas, and I'm not going to talk about them. So the reason we're interested in, vi in these viruses is not, I mean, w w as a vet, I'm interested in them because they infect animals. As a CDC employee, I'm interested in them because they have the potential to infect humans, <coughs> both di either directly from birds or via an intermediate host like swine. And if we look at the 
um, the sources of the last pandemics, we can, go, we can trace back subtypes of the pandemics back to 1918. Before that, we don't know what the subtypes were because we can't do molecular biology. Um, as you probably have heard, the, the 1918 virus uh, was isolated from uh, soldiers who died in, I believe, the Arctic and were per buried in permafrost, and the virus was isolated from them after uh, some 90 years or so. Um, so we know the subtypes of these viruses. This is an avian virus. This is an avian virus. This is a virus that has avian surface proteins and some human internals. The, in 1976, there's what's called a, a, a pseudo-pandemic. This H1N1 had disappeared in 1956. When H2N2 appeared, it if somehow it made the other virus go extinct. In 1976, H1N1 reappeared, uh, except that it didn't reappear after 20 years of changes. You can look at the genome of flu viruses and you can count back how many years they've been evolving. Because they mutate so rapidly, you can count back and you can see how, how old these, how, how long these viruses have gone. This was a virus that was a 1955 virus or so. So it, it arose from somewhere in the east and it's very clearly a lab escape. So this is some, somewhere uh, in the east, in Russia or in China, uh, Japan, somewhere in that area. Some people have been doing research on this virus. It escaped, it caused a pandemic and is back with us and it hasn't gone away. Um, which uh, we are very aware of at the CDC as we do research on things like H2N2. Uh, and then in 2009, uh, there's the exception. We have the, the H1N1 pandemic. So at this point, you know, the, the, the CDC was pretty sure they knew how to, at least what to expect for a pandemic, right? We, 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 they were pretty sure it was going to be an avian virus pretty sure it was going to come from the east, as all of these other viruses did, from areas where there was a lot of interaction between wild birds and backyard flocks, for example. And then, of course, um, this virus came out of Mexico, and it was a swine virus. Uh, George Klein once said that the stupidest virus is smarter than the smartest virologist. <laughs> <coughs> So, uh, you know, it goes back to the drawing board at that point. But that swine virus actually originated ultimately as an avian virus. It has significant avian contributions to its genome. And that's the virus that's now uh, circulating among us. It drove the previous H1N1 ex extinct and is now one of the, the, the three common viruses that circulate um, in, in, in flu season, which is coming up. So if anyone's feeling uh, Sniffly right now, you might have one of these things. So our concern is not so much for the animal viruses. Our concern is for their potential to infect humans. Um, you can get direct infection of humans. You can have people who are infected with a purely avian virus. You can get various paths. You can get waterfowl to poultry to humans. You can get humans to swine and swine to humans. You can follow all of these paths via intact viruses, you, the virus as a whole, or you, because of reassortment, you can get single segments following these paths and, and moving along any of these paths. And that's what happened with the 2009 pandemic where you can track individual segments back through various different sources uh, and various different pathways. And so, uh, you know, the, the, this is showing what the potential of what could happen. This is showing mortality uh, of the U.S. since 1900. This, this is overall mortality. Uh, this is infectious disease mortality. And you can see, uh, you know, that mortality has really improved a lot as uh, nutrition improved, as sanitation improved, as vaccines started to kick in. But you can also see right here at 1918 what happened, and that massive spike in U.S. deaths is 1918 pandemic. That's a virus that within uh, a month covered across the USA. Within less than six months covered the world and killed 50 to 100 million people. Um, and that's what the potential of a flu pandemic is. <clears throat> so could that happen again? Are, you know, are there avian viruses that are jumping into humans nowadays? 
So here's uh, some of the zoonotic diseases of humans, of animal influenza viruses since uh, the, the 1990s or so. H5N1 is probably one you've all heard of. This is the, the, the one that most people think of as bird flu, avian flu. Uh, that appeared in 1997, uh, reappeared in the 2000s. It's uh, infected well over 600 people, which is not a very large number on a global scale and over many years. Um, it's killed about well over half of those people, so that's obviously a source of concern. Uh, if we look at some of these other viruses, there's these H7 viruses, rare causes of, of human infection, but they have the potential. If we look at this H7N7, that represents basically a single outbreak in 2003, and then it disappeared. If we look at this H7N9, you've probably heard of that as well. That's an, a virus that moved probably from poultry into people in China this spring. Uh, in, it infected a large number of people, a hundred odd people um, in the spring. The authorities shut down the domestic uh, poultry markets in there and the virus disappeared. But many of these viruses, as you know from experience, like to circulate in the winter. We're now back in winter and there have been more cases. This needs to be updated. There's now 137 cases. Been, there's been a couple more this fall. And then there's this one, the H3N2V. That's a swine virus. It originated as a combination of human viruses. Um, as I said, swine are, do just crazy stuff in terms of reassortment. This has a wild combination of, inter of genes. Um, but it's basically an H3N2. H3N2 is one of our circulating viruses that we mostly have reasonable immunity to. As I said, swine preserve fossil viruses, and this is a virus that most people, especially young people, do not have good immunity to. These 300 odd cases are almost all children. Uh, they're almost all children who are kissing pigs at the state fairs. <laughs> you can see what happened here. We had a few cases in 2011. I think there were 12. Then last year, there were over 300. And then this year, when we were expecting to have many hundreds, there was almost nothing. The viruses, either the virus or the pigs or somebody has, uh, uh, is doing something that we don't understand. And just to show, to put this into a little more context, this is the case fatality rate. H5N1, which is of course, it has been a major concern for a long time, has a very high case fatality rate of over, over 60%. Um, these guys are all, have all been very mild cases. There's only been a handful of them, so we don't know what the what potential mortality rate is. There have been no deaths, they've all been very mild diseases. The 2003 outbreak I mentioned had one death. That was a veterinarian who visited the poultry farm, but apparently didn't touch any chickens. Um, the H7N9 outbreak that's ongoing right now in China has a 20 or 30 percent mortality rate. And the H3N2 swine virus, almost all uh, very mild cases, one fatality in an immunocompromised person. So you may be thinking, you know, if we look at something like this, a 1% mortality rate may not sound very high at first glance. But if we think about the 1918 virus, that had a 2.5% mortality rate and it killed 100 million people. These pandemic viruses, when they move into the human population, infect 50 to 70% of the population. Right? So if you look at the global population, that's 3, 4 billion people. It doesn't, you know, 1% of many billions of people is a large number. So even small <laughs> case fatality rates cause a huge burden with flu. The seasonal viruses, the, 19, the, the 2009 virus, the pandemic virus, which had a very large economic burden, had a low mortality rate of 0.01. We have no idea what causes the differences in these mortality rates. <clears throat> so, what can we do about this? And I've already pointed out that flu, virus, flu viruses change at a tremendous rate, both through mutation and through reassortment. So they're moving targets. We've talked about these things, we talk, we talk about them as antigenic shift and antigenic drift. Um, you know, again, I want to emphasize reassortment does not only mean uh, antigenic shift. Reassortment can change the personality of the virus in many other ways.
just as mutation can change the personality of the virus in many other ways. So the these viruses are changing all the time uh, in, in their characteristics. And that means their ability to infect new hosts, their ability to cause disease, their ability to cause severe disease, to transmit between individuals, and so on. So reassortment makes new viruses. Um, and it's common. It's something, you know, it's maybe 1% of flu viruses are, are examples of reassortment. Which again, 1% doesn't sound like a very large number, but we're talking about, you know, very, very large numbers of infections. That's the reassortment history of the 2009 pandemic. And that's what most swine viruses look like right now. If we track back far enough, each of these lines here represents one of the eight segments of viruses. We've got classical 1918, we've got avian virus origin, we've got 1918 origin, we've got avian viruses from Europe, we've got H3N2 viruses from humans, all rearranging and reassorting at, a constant, at an incredible rate and then spitting out at the other end a virus with completely new properties that we had not seen before, but that was very well suited to very efficient spread between humans. Fortunately, it also had a low mortality rate, but we have no idea why that's the case. And just, again, put this into context, H5N1 is a product of multiple reassortments. H3N2 is, your, is a swine virus. It looks like the, the one I just showed you is crazy reassorted. If we look at the H7N9, that's a reassortment between two major different lineages of viruses. These are all presumably taken on new characteristics through their reassortment in completely unpredictable ways that we have not been able to track. And mutation is even more complicated. So in mutation, You've got a, every virus is a mutant, essentially. There's no such thing as a non-mutant influenza virus. It's just a cloud of virus, uh, of different variants, each with slightly different capabilities surrounding an average. Because every time you infect a new host, you're making hundreds of thousands of new viruses. That means you're making 100,000 new mutants with every infection. And there's lots of infections every year. Of course, mutation and variation in general plus selection equals, equals evolution. And evolution in flu is very, very fast. We routinely see new variants of flu within a couple of days, certainly within weeks, always within a year. And that's why it's a moving target. So the virus is never the same. We can prepare for the viruses that we're seeing today uh, we can make some guesses for the viruses we're going to see in six months. Um, it's really tough to figure out what we're going to be seeing in a year. If we're thinking about what's driving evolution, so I said that variation plus natural selection uh, drives evolution. We know that in humans, at least, one of the major drivers is population immunity. And that, doesn't, that should not be surprising. That's a major source of, of uh, evolution for most viruses. We, already, we, we all know that flu viruses rapidly change their, um, their immunological characteristics because the flu, virus, flu vaccines have to be changed every year. And that's because every few years, the flu viruses change their personality so they're no longer susceptible to the, to the vaccine. And that's not random. That's because the population immunity that was bolstered by these vaccines as well as by previous infection is driving these viruses to form a new successful lineage that's no longer uh, inhibited by these and have a new population to replicate in once again. <clears throat> this is uh, a phylogenetic tree just showing the surface HA protein, the major immunological protein of H3N2 virus. That's a virus that was an avian virus that jumped into humans in 1968. And here we're tracking the evolution through, 19, through 2002, so 34 years. Each of these colors represents a new vaccine formulation. So for several years after introduction, the virus didn't change antigenically, and it was controlled by the same vaccine. Then in 1972, there was a new vaccine introduced because the virus had changed. 1975, 1977, and so on. What I'd like you to look at is this really nice diagonal pathway. All right, so what that's telling you is that the viruses, the global virus population is changing as a unit, all right? So these are not 
clustering and spreading out as a bushy branch. This is a, a tree that's moving in a single direction. And I'm going to compare that to H5N1 viruses. This is half the period of evolution, so this is since 1996. This is in a smaller geographical area because it doesn't include North America. And this is in chickens almost <laughs> entirely. Uh, main, the virus is also in wild birds, but it's a lot harder to find uh, surveillance information for wild birds. So most of our surveillance information is a little indirect for that. But these, this is chicken information. And what you see is a very different picture, right? You see a very branchy version. And these are pretty much regional var variants. You have Ch Southeast Asia variants. You have Indonesia, India. You have the Middle East and Africa, uh, Egypt, and some other countries around there. And each of those is moving in its own direction. These viruses are, in poultry, are not as interconnected as humans. Essentially, the entire global human population is a single you know, evolutionary unit as far as flu viruses are concerned. They can spread through the entire globe within, within weeks. And you probably remember again in 2009, the virus was identified in, in Mexico in April. Within a few weeks, it was in Australia, it was in Europe, it was all the way through the US, it was in Canada. It only took a few weeks for the 2009 pandemic to spread. Humans are really interconnected. And they don't even need airplanes to be interconnected. Because if you look back at history, pre-airplane, pre, even pre-railroad, in the 1873 pandemics, you can still see the virus spreading around the world within six months. Humans are really interconnected, chickens are not. And so what you have is chicken, communities of chickens where the virus can independently evolve. And it moves in its own uh, in individual direction. And that's why you have this cluster. But what that means is that you don't have a single virus to deal with as you do with the H3N2 I showed you, where there's just a single point to that pathway. You have a really complex series of viruses moving off in different directions. So for example, in this, this, remember this is half the period I showed you for the H3N2. This is one area, this is Southeast Asia and China. And if we look at what we would need to cover some protection, not great protection, but some protection against these viruses in humans, it would take at least 10 vaccines to do that. So, in humans, one virus, H3N2, it needed 10 vaccines over about 34 years. So that's a lot. That's more than we have to do for most uh, viruses, right? But it still is manageable. If we were looking at H5N1, that's one subset of one strain of one avian virus. Remember, there are hundreds and hundreds of different avian virus strains out there. And in half the period, it would need at least as many vaccines and probably a lot more. So at the CDC, thinking about prevention, our only tool for, pre really our, one of our only tools for prevention against flu is vaccination. There's really very little we can do in terms of, you know, conceivably uh, antiviral resistance and antiviral drugs and so on are just not practical for the kind of numbers that we'd be talking about in any kind of uh, pandemic situation. So we have to be thinking about vaccination. And that's not possible. I just showed you that we can't even do that for H5N1 in any practical way. So what do we do? <clears throat> we have two choices. One is to do risk assessment and minimize the number of vaccines that we would have to make. And that's really the only tool we have right now. Um, that's guesswork. And in 2009, the goal was to prevent, to provide vaccines against H5N1 from Southeast Asia. And the challenge to humans turned out to be 2009 pandemic from Mexico, from swine. So there was no vaccine for it. So you, what we can do is try and formalize the risk assessment process. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about that today, but I just want to point out that's, that's really been our best tool right now, to try and predict which viruses are the greatest risk which viruses we need to focus on, and how we're going to do it. And so there's a formal uh, influenza risk assessment tool that the CDC and WHO uh, developed. Uh, I was peripherally involved with that, and it was a very interesting process. Uh, 
uh, and it factors in weighted averages considering what we know about many different characteristics of each virus. So we consider uh, the severity in lab, an lab animals, we consider the geo geographic distribution, we consider its propensity for reassortment, uh, we consider its ability to transmit, and so on and so forth. Uh, each of those is weighted, is, uh, is summed. In many cases, we, don't, we have to leave many of those simply blank because we don't have enough information. That's very useful in itself because it tells us where we need to be doing further research. But at the end of it, we can end up with a weighted risk assessment for each virus and focus on making vaccines against the most serious, uh, the ones that we consider the most serious ones. That's about what we can do now. In the long run, that's not the goal. The, in the long run, the goal is to make better vaccines. So we, right now, we have to renew our, our flu vaccines. We should get a flu vaccine every year because the flu vaccines for humans are not great. They don't last a long time. And on top of that, the flu viruses change antigenically enough that the flu virus, the vaccine is not long lasting. They're not great vaccines. They have a 50 to 70% protective rate. That's still better than getting the flu yourself. So go and get your flu vaccine, please. I've had mine. Um, making the vaccine is not an overnight process. The vaccines are grown in eggs. You don't get 200 million fertilized eggs with a one week lead time, right? So you take, you, you have many months to set up the preparation for these vaccines. And then you have to inoculate them, prepare sterile, uh, uh, you know, sp sterile vials, distribute. Uh, it's a slow response. If you have a pandemic after six months, the, it's too late, right? The vi virus has already been around the world. Everybody's either dead or immune. So these vaccines are the best we can do. We can do risk assessment. We can prepare the vaccines ahead of time. We can make a start. We can make stockpiles. We can make guesses as to what we're going to do. There are stockpiles of vaccines against a number of the viruses that are considered the highest risk. Um, but let's step back a bit and think a little bit about the problem from sort of a more basic viewpoint. This again is our H3N2 evolution over 34 years. We've got 10 vaccines in there. How much did the virus change to, make the, uh, to require a new vaccine? On average, it took about four to six point mutations in the, in the hemagglutinin gene to require a new vaccine. And that's in a protein that's about uh, uh, 550 600 amino acids long. So it's about 1% of the protein has to change before the virus is no longer well controlled by the previous vaccine. So five or six mutations and we need a new vaccine. The vaccines work by antibodies. Humans can make an astronomical number of, anti of antibodies. Just for context, there's more antibodies capable of being made in a human than there are in the Milky Way galaxy. So if we have the potential to make 10 to the 12th different antibodies, how come virus can escape that huge rep potential repertoire with such a small number of, of changes? And we don't know the answer, but that, this is what I'm going to talk about for, that's ongoing in my lab. <clears throat> the flip side of that question, of course, is can we stop that? And if we, is it possible to make a vaccine that ignores these five or six changes and continues to protect against the virus for a much longer period? So if we can make a vaccine that's good for 10 years, if we can make a vaccine that sees many of the branches on that bush of the H5N1 that I showed you, then that would change the story a lot. You know, we'd have a much better protection. Our risk assessment would be much easier because we could make coverage of a much wider range of viruses. So far, we cannot do that. And so the question is why we can't. So the project that I'm going to talk about now is uh, single cell cloning. So what we basically did is we immunized mice uh, with the 2009 pandemic virus and vaccine. We purified individual B cells from them. B cells are the antibody-making cells. Um, we cloned from these individual B cells the antibody genes, and then we analyzed them to see what was going on. And I'm just going to quickly remind you, for those of you who haven't looked at immunology for a while, that this is roughly what an antibody looks like. It has a heavy chain, a light chain. They're held together by disulfide bonds. Up at the tip, you have a number of copies of a variable region that physically bind to the antigen. It's this region that we cloned. We did not try and we didn't bother cloning this 
down here because we know what that looks like already. That's the same as a constant region. This is different. That's, these are the ones that have the 10 to the 12th different possibilities. And so that's the region that we cloned from these B cells. And that's as much as I'm going to do to talk about the met methods of today. So I'm just going to ask you to take my word for it that we did actually do these experiments and uh, they, they're going to sh they showed what I'm uh, going to tell you. Um, we ended up cloning 50-odd uh, uh, antibodies. This is technically very difficult work, by the way, and uh, I was fortunate that I have two molecular biology wizards in my team who were able to make this work um, with a great deal of effort. Uh, we confirmed that these antibodies are specific for HA as they should have been. And then the next question we asked is how variable is the antibody response to flu? In other words, we know that it has this enormous potential repertoire against flu. How big is the actual repertoire? Is there only a single antibody that can, that can protect against it? Are there a million antibodies that can protect against this? Um, and this is just one of the ways we looked at this. This is uh, a heat map showing similarity uh, within heavy chain and light chain. These are the different uh, clones that we made. Red means they're very similar. And so what you can see, if you look at the light chain, you can see that we pulled out a big bunch of protein of, of variable regions that were identical. We have this big patch here. We have this patch here where there were essentially identical uh, light chain sequences. If you look at the heavy chain, we have this patch here where there's a fairly good identity. And even over here where there's not actually identity, you can see that the variable regions were actually very similar. And so without going into the molecular details, what it looks like here is that there's various paths for this antibody, but they're all focusing down on a similar sequence because there seem to be only a very limited number of sequences that are capable of being functional antibodies against HA. And to, when we did, we plugged these into various equations. Um, the the, the uh, approach that we used is basically the one that uh, ecologists use when they're trying to ask how many species they are. You go out into the Amazon jungle, you capture butterflies, you ask how many times you capture the same species, and then you go back and you use that data to estimate how many butterfly species there are in the entire Amazon. We did the same thing for antibodies, and we concluded that from the amount of repetition that we saw, in our very limited sample, there's really a fairly small number of antibodies in our repertoire. We estimate that there's somewhere between, there's less than 150 heavy chains, less than 50 light chain families. And that, again, in this, the context of this enormous potential repertoire, this is a really small number, at least to me it seems like a really small number. There's potentially more diversity than that. Uh, for various reasons that I, I won't go into. I'm happy to talk about it uh, afterwards if you like, but we, we think that there's potential to have more than 150. We suspect from what we're seeing that the repertoire is less than 500. <clears throat> so if the repertoire is less than 500, if there's only a 500 antibodies that are giving protection against flu, then I think it becomes a lot easier to understand how the virus can escape from that, right? There's a limited number of, of antibodies. They are seeing, they're recognizing various points on the, on the protein, but again, there's some overlap. Even viruses that have different sequences are seeing some similar regions. And so with this sort of limited repertoire, it's much more practical for the virus to escape, so long as these virus, these antibodies really are specific for this particular um, uh, HA that we, we raised them against. And so that was the next question we asked. We took these uh, hemagglutinins, so we, what we had done with them is we cloned them into uh, a background that we were able to express them, uh, purify them, and, and assess them in a, you know, standard immunological assays. Um, when antibodies uh, get stimulated, they undergo a mutation process. And this mutation process, which is called somatic, somatic hypermutation or affinity maturation, drives the antibody along a pathway where it binds better to its target. And so you can look at most antibodies, and if the antibodies have been through a process of repeated exposure or inflammation or anything that drives this process, then you'll be able to count mutations in, in, in the antibodies. And so we asked, how many mutations have accumulated in the antibodies that we saw? And the answer was that there are around 15, 10 to 15 mutations or so on average 
So that's a significant amount. That tells us these, these antibodies had been pushed down this pathway of affinity maturation. And so we, expected, we would expect that they would be fairly high binders and that they would be fairly specific for the protein that they were working with. <coughs> I went to my um, molecular biology wizards and said, can we make these look like the original antibodies? What would they behave like if they had no mutations? And Pin took a week or two, and then he took these viruses and swapped in 15 mutations into them and reverted them back to the initial start. And he, so we have at this point an antibody as it comes off the B cell with no changes, and we have an antibody that came off the B cell after many of these changes, after all this stimulation. And so we're able to ask, what happens to this recognition as this mutation process in the antibody progresses? The answer is, it goes way down. So the initial antibody, as it came off the B cell, we, we threw that against a panel of many different viruses, 1918 virus, 1933 virus, 1946, 55, uh, there was 95 in there, a 2007. We had about 10 different uh, viruses uh, over the years, and these initial antibodies recognized most of them. So the virus, the, the antibody, as it came off the B cell in its very early <coughs> stages, was very broadly cross-reactive. And remember, that's our goal for vaccines, is to make antibodies that are very cross-reactive. But as it moved down this uh, mutation pathway, it lost that cross-reactivity, and it really only recognized well one virus at the end, the one we immunized it with. And finally, what happens to the affinity? Remember, this process is called affinity maturation, and it's designed to improve the quality of the antibody. And here, we saw what you'd expect, that the initial virus can recognize many viruses, sorry, the initial antibody can recognize many viruses, but it does not do a good job of it. All of these viruses bound with low affinity, in some cases, we were just barely able to recognize, to detect the binding. In some cases, we were easily able to detect the binding, but it was still many hundreds of times worse than the binding of the mature antibody to our protein. So what this is telling me, first of all, the initial antibodies that come off are low affinity, but very broadly cross-reactive. Is a low affinity antibody sufficient to give protection? We, so we have to test that. The odds are that it probably is. If you get enough of this antibody circulating in the serum, these are very likely to be protective antibodies against a wide range of viruses. <clears throat> so what's happening is that we're starting off on our very first exposure to flu virus. We're probably starting off with a bunch of very poor quality antibodies that offer us good protection against many, many viruses. Most of you probably saw your first flu virus when you were about two years old. And then you saw your second one when you were about three years old, and your third one when you were about four or five. And you've probably seen 10, 20, 30 different flu viruses along the years. And each of those has pushed your antibodies along, a new, along the pathway of better affinity. They're, your antibodies are now much more effective than they were when you were two years old. But they're seeing a far smaller range of viruses. So at least that offers a, 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 you know, a potential goal. We, we know that now that there are cross-reactive antibodies. And, and by the way, um, there's lots of other evidence for this. This is not the only line of evidence for this. Cross, broadly cross-reactive antibodies have been found from people infected naturally with flu virus. But they seem to be very rare. Those are highly, highly um, high affinity broadly cross-reactive, as well as some low affinity ones. So, this pathway is a real one, it's not just a mouse one. Um, we need to figure out how we can push it along that way, how we can push affinity without losing this cross-reactivity. And we think there are ways to do that. <clears throat> and how do we can work with this to produce a vaccine that has the potential to make at least a moderately cross-reactive, moderately uh, high affinity uh, vaccine that's capable of giving resistance to many different viruses. And that's really the, the goal of all, you know, a huge amount of flu research around the world. Uh, I'm gonna stop there and uh, thank the people who did the work. This is most of my team. This young lady is not yet a member of my team. Um, 
Pin and Jason are the guys who did most of the molecular biology on the, uh, the, the antibody project I talked about. We had tremendous help from uh, Robert Barrington at University of South Alabama, um, without whom we would never have managed to clone these antibodies. Uh, and April, who's now in, uh, in the UK with a vaccine, flu vaccine company, um, but who started this project in my team a few years ago, uh, got it up and working. Um, and so I'm going to stop there uh, and uh, be happy to take any questions. <laughs>